a lot of beautiful uh, symbolism here. For me um, and my family, you know, thinking about this room, um, there's some of you that um, have more memories of my brother Dan than I do. You know, you can see I was pretty young. Um, you know, if we were in a far-flung place, if we had moved, we wouldn't have had this moment together, right? To come back to this church. Um, that meant so much to my family. I was just telling my boys this morning that uh, I pretty much lived here about half my life. And I lived off of powdered um, hot chocolate from the kitchen. Uh, um, so it's a beautiful thing that we can remember, Dan. And the tragedy, uh, right, is part of the story, and it's um, something that we all share. It's not just our family, right? Um, and, uh, and so it's a beautiful thing that we can kind of remember uh, Dan's strength, his life, uh, reflect on the tragedy, and then be so grateful, be so happy that a struggle is over and that um, what he's experiencing now is far better than what he left behind. One of my memories of Dan is after the accident, and um, I must have been 12, and he's living in our basement, right? And life has been turned upside down uh, for us. And, um, but he's recovering, you know? And you can see at Bob's wedding, Bob and Deb's wedding, how far he had recovered. And, uh, and so I remember my dad said, well, you know, like life is getting back to normal. Dan, you and Dave are going to uh, stack this whole wood pile. And we had this massive wood pile in the backyard. It was like somebody had dumped so many trees and they were like not burnable logs. So we had to saw through a lot of them. So Dan and I, over one summer, and my boys can appreciate this. I think dad got us brand new gloves from the hardware store for this special project and a new saw. And we were gonna uh, stack, the, go through and stack this massive pile of wood. And Dan and I did it. It took us all weekend, maybe three days. And um, as we're clearing the, the wood pile, there was uh, a sapling. It was a maple tree. Uh, and mom might know where it is. Mom might know where I'm going with this. <laughs> um, so this maple tree, uh, Dan and I decided to plant it on the back of the yard. and. Um, it is a magnificent maple tree. It's probably 50 feet high now. Probably one of the most young and vibrant trees in the yard. <laughs> Isn't that neat? That what lied ahead was another 40 years, nearly 40 years of struggle. I think in the early days, the family saw Dan's progression. We thought, well, we know Dan's gonna get back to his old self. He's gonna maybe have a little bit of issues with coordination or memory, but he's gonna be back to it. And that's what that, wood pile that we accomplished together represented. God had a different story. He was growing a tree that we could not predict, that um, had a greater impact than anything that we could have fashioned. And it was gonna be fashioned in struggle for 39 more years. The words of Habakkuk, my brother Bob chose for the obituary that I thought were beautiful. And so I looked at that this week and reflected on that. Habakkuk was a prophet in the Old Testament and he, um, this is about 600 years before the time of Christ. Scholars said that this was a dark time for the nation of Israel, that um, quote, the international threat coincided with the period of increasing moral and spiritual deterioration. Sounds a lot like now. Uh, I, I see a lot of similarities between Dan and Habakkuk. Habakkuk didn't see the success that uh, he hoped for, that he tried to prophesy uh, to stem. It was uh, shortly thereafter that um, the king of Israel would be taken captive by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, and so some of the long captivity would happen in Israel. Dan never saw the success that he thought he was promised, the success that he thought he had worked for, that he was, uh, you know, the accolades that he thought uh, would continue. Dan and Habakkuk saw that there was corruption within uh, and without. 
that there was darkness and grief everywhere. And as Dan struggled through in the subsequent years of his recovery, he could see the weakness and the brokenness inside himself. And yet in this defiance, if you will, of Habakkuk, the last three verses of Habakkuk's three chapter prophetic word, it's a, a hymn of faith. And as Dan grew older, we felt like this is, you know, that he, he understood and he kept the faith. And he became more interesting and understood that he was called for this purpose that, thank goodness, not many of us are. And so we watched from outside and we prayed and we, we asked that God would um, soften the blow. But God kept him alive for 40 years. But this is the prayer of defiance that Habakkuk says, and that really could be Dan's words. Hmm. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor the fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, and I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on high hills. I think um, there's another uh, more poignant victory that Habakkuk was pointing towards and Dan experienced and now Dan knows, right? He experienced it by faith, but now he knows. Death has been swallowed up in victory, said the Apostle Paul. Where, O oh, death, is your victory and where, O oh, death, is your sting? Yes, the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it means a lot to us. It, it really does. Um, I'm going to uh, kind of dovetail onto what Dave has spoken about there and, and maybe give you a little background too. Um, many of you know part of the story, some of the story, and uh, so I'll just, um, I'll start just what recently happened with the passing. Um, Dan became sick this past Wednesday night um, at, at the nursing home. They thought that he was doing better, but then they noticed on Thursday that he wasn't breathing as well. And so they brought him over to Carroll County Hospital. And then at the hospital, uh, they did of course a lot of testing and they, they saw that he had a blockage, which he has had before in his intestines. Um, but he also had some pressure on his blood vessels that made it a little bit different, which was the breathing problem. And then the more they looked at it, they realized that the, uh, the breathing problem was also because um, the infection um, had, had, I guess, killed off, if you will, part of his intestines. And uh, they would need to do a, a risky surgery uh, if he was to, quote, make it through. Um, and Dan was, of course, quite weak by now. Um, but, and not very coherent, but I, I will tell you that uh, the Lord was very good to us at, at this time. Uh, Bob and I were there, and uh, the doctor came in, and we were trying to discuss, you know, will you, will you be resuscitated, you know, I mean, uh, and so on, and uh, what the surgery would entail. And Dan, who was not coherent that much that uh, Thursday night, was the most coherent that he had been uh, all night. And we peppered him with questions about this to make sure that we were following Dan's will, you know, because these were big decisions. And it became quite clear that he did not want to go through this risky surgery, that he was ready. Um, and he said it uh, very clearly uh, that I, I want to die, not in a self-pitying way, not in a, but, it, you know, it, I, I'm ready. And he was. We had been uh, talking about it with him. Uh, all night, uh, things that we've said to him before about just the glory that awaits him, the promises that are his, and uh, he was ready. And so we, we, we were weepy-eyed, of course, but, and we knew that, that, uh, that sepsis would set in and that he would pass. Um, and fortune, but the Lord was blessed him that, the, that he went rather quickly, the, the very next day, in fact. I went to work. Um, Bob was over there earlier. But uh, uh, 
Vivian, Bob, and my wife Lori, and Bob and I got to be there, and Bob and I got to be there to the very end, and that was uh, meaningful and good. Uh, I think he knew that we were there, okay, um, and so, but, uh, but again, uh, you know, that just, that was, well, that, that's sort of the last few days. But I want to go back even further. Um, if you, you can't help but talk about Dan without talking about suffering. And, and that's, he, and so I had to think about it. You know, I, I want to talk about what the Bible says about it, but I also want to relate it to Daniel and just uh, use Dan as, as, if you will, as an illustration of what the Bible teaches here. So I'm going to start back in, in Genesis, and you have the fall. And in the fall, um, the consequence of man's sin is that they're going to suffer. And, if they're, and eventually they're going to suffer to the point of dying. Okay? And, and it's going to look like many different things. It's going to look like illness and pain and affliction and mental illness and, and you know, grief and isolation. And it's not just the believers that will experience this. All men will. This is a curse that is visited upon us all. But even in this most dire announcement, because of man's sin, uh, the foreshadowing of Christ is mentioned. That Christ will come and he will end this. And that is God's good plan. Um, uh, he will end this and, and that uh, he will, he will be the, bring the victory to this. And, but as long as we're on this earth, we are going to suffer all of us are. And so, um, so I try to say, all right, what is, all right God, God, why? You could end this now, okay? And you certainly are good and you're certainly capable. Um, but uh, I'm going to explore that a little bit more, maybe why. Um, if I go back to Dan's life just briefly here, um, you saw some of that in there. He, of the six of us, he was the, the most gifted. He was the smartest, the brightest, the, the funniest, okay? Um, he was the homecoming king. He was a scholar athlete. He was the most valuable athlete. He was most likely to succeed. Uh, truly blessed in many ways. And, uh, and, and he was a believer as a, as a young man. Even more blessed, right? Um, but at the same time, when our mother became ill, um, I think he was, a, he was a freshman in college, okay? And I was a junior in high school, by the way. Um, but he did not handle that well. And of the six of us, he was the most impacted by it, suffered the most for it, if you will. Uh, my mom was suffering, of course, and, and he did not handle it well. It, um, it, it showed where he needed to grow. And, and I don't fault him this way. He's a, he's a teenager. He's, he's 19 years old. You know what I mean? He's, he's young in the faith. He's young in life. And, and God gave him something that he was not yet ready to handle in the way that uh, we, would, we would all like to handle suffering. Okay? And so he developed an eating disorder that, uh, that weakened him and dropped out of college. This is somebody who after had so much success academically. Um, that uh, he, uh, he tried to rebound. He was accepted into the Coast Guard Academy based on his high academic standing. And, um, and so he was supposed to go back that August. Um, it is in May on his birthday, his 20th birthday, not too far from here, up on Route 27, that he was riding his bike when he was hit by a car. Um, he was always struggling here, mental illness. God was still his savior. But he could, not, he could not hang on to the hope at that point. He was struggling. But that doesn't mean that God let go of him. Um, and so even in this incredibly tragic accident, you say, all right, God, this is not how I would turn Dan around from what he was struggling with. I would, I would do much more, I'm a much better approach. Uh, but God, of course, has a much richer tapestry of what he plans to do with Dan's life and, and our lives. And so Dan had this car accident on 27, okay? And he was head injured and, and nearly died. And then he was in a coma for a long time. And then he came out and he was head injured, uh, which especially affected his memory. And then later on, he really struggled with a chemical imbalance that made him manic depressive. And for years, doctors struggled with trying to get that balance. Uh, I'm sharing all this with you because I want you to understand that um, through all of this suffering, and, and let's, let's be perfectly honest, someone was brought on by himself, poor choices, you know, and, and by the way, we all do, we suffer some natural consequences. If you, um, 
Yeah, those who are lazy don't have food, okay? Those who are foolish with their money go broke, okay? Uh, the adulterers lose their family and their kids and so on. And, and we all suffer because of our own. But, and there's always that element. But Dan suffered for, well, um, bigger causes, I, I believe, okay? Um, and I, I want to flesh those out maybe a little bit more. Um, so through all these struggles and ups and downs, okay, um, well, we know that suffering is always for our good. And the Lord, we all have pride, and uh, God wanted to humble him in, in a way that, uh, that most of us have not experienced. And he did, and uh, took all that pride that, that Dan had. And, and, he, and, and we, when I say pride, anytime we hold on to things uh, that, we, that get in the way of our relationship with God, hold on to them too tightly, God often takes them away from us. And it exposes our character. Um, what are we, again, what are we clinging to? What are we hoping to? What, when, we, when God takes away something, how do we, how do we respond to him? And uh, because of the mental illness, there was times where Dan did not respond well. And I, and I say mental illness and sin, because uh, they're, they're, they're never completely separate. Um, where he would be angry with God, curse God throughout his Bible. Um, and then he would repent. And often we were there to witness that. And that was always a beautiful thing. And Dan never, never um, blamed his mental illness. The chemical imbalance made me do this. It was never, that was never his story. Um, he, heartfelt repentance, okay? And then, and, it would, and he would read his Bible and, and he would grow and then something else would happen if he would step back, okay? Um, and, and yet he would continue to bounce back. But it revealed his character, it stripped his pride in a way that, that was uh, amazing to watch um, him grow over the 40 years of this uh, affliction. In fact, it uh, exposed my sin, my selfishness, my idols in a way that probably nothing else could have. Uh, to spend time with Dan uh, would be to make you realize how the things that you are getting upset about are, are quite trivial, you know. Uh, the lack of contentedness because something doesn't go your way. Uh, how you're holding on to things too tightly. Uh, and, and I think he had that impact on so many of you here, and I think that's why you're here. Um, that it, 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 uh, it, was a, it was a ministry, it was a witness. Uh, to, uh, Dan became so thankful uh, for the smallest things. Cup of coffee. <laughs> he loved coffee. And he really appreciated it when you brought him coffee. Um, for, to spend time with him. Very thankful, okay, for that. Um, the small things that, that he held on to and was thankful to you and to God for it, it was really neat to see God not just reveal his character, but change his character to make him a, a useful vessel. Um, one of the goals of suffering is that we, uh, we, we, with the comfort we receive, we are then to give it on to others. Um, and uh, especially in, in the body of, of Christ, we are to, um, I think in 1 Corinthians 12 talks about uh, the real purpose of suffering so that we will rally and support that person. And, uh, and Dan, Dan did that. He taught my family that. Uh, to, and we are, we are changing better people for, it, for that. And of course, suffering points us to a great truth that this world is not our home. For believers, this is not our final place. We have a much better home. In fact, we can look at this world and say it's broken. It's, there's something wrong with it. Uh, there's something wrong inside of us. There's something wrong in the world itself that make us long for a, a, a different home. And, uh, you know, suffering teaches us not to hold on to this world too tightly, not to love this world too tightly, because it's, um, we're pilgrims. We're passing through, and we have a better home. All of us will face Dan's fate at some point. We will, we will, be, we will die. And, uh, and we will probably suffer more and more along the way as we, as we get older and so on. But for the Christian, it's, it's a reminder of what awaits us and that this is not where we uh, our final resting place.
And it makes us content because we are grateful for what we have and not expecting often so much more. Um, I don't want to ramble too much here, but, um, but I also just want to say that suffering glorifies God. Um, a couple passages come to mind. In, in John 9, you have the, uh, the man who was, uh, the, was brought to Jesus and he's blind. And uh, the people who are with him say, you know, Lord, uh, this man, he's blind. Is it, is it the sin of him or his parents that he's blind? And, um, and, and Jesus says, well, um, well, neither really. He says, the reason he uh, is here and he's blind is so that he may glorify me. Uh, and right then he heals him. And the point of it is that uh, his whole purpose of this suffering that this person went through was because I was going to heal him on this day. And the news would go out as a great witness. And so it was to glorify God. Okay? This is a, this life on this earth is a twinkling of an eye, if you will, compared to the future glory that we have. Okay? And if God can use it uh, for a greater purpose. Amen. You see Lazarus in John 11. Lazarus uh, is, is dying, and Jesus knows about it. In fact, the messenger comes and says, hey, Lazarus is about to die. Or, you know, he's sick. Come quickly. Um... It's a good chance he was already dead, to be honest, by the time the messenger got there. Jesus waits two more days before he goes to Lazarus. Um, yes, Lazarus is going to suffer here. Lazarus is going to go through this terrible, his, uh, Martha and Mary are going to suffer. They're going to experience terrible pain these next two days. But God has a much bigger plan for Lazarus and Martha and Mary. And they will love him more for it than if he would have come right away. They will experience some great suffering and will experience a great comfort. It can only come from being united with Christ. And so he comes and he raises him from the dead, only when it's absolutely sure that this guy is dead and, and long, long dead and gone. And God uses him for his glory and to grow his people. Paul, the, the greatest apostle, has a thorn in the flesh that he prays three times to have it removed. Uh, and God says, no, because when you are weak, I am strong. You are a better, useful tool to me. And you are blessed, in fact, by being weak. You can't see it. Paul can't see it. But God does. Hey, God does. So I look at Dan and all the ups and downs of his struggling. And I say that we don't know all the ways that God used Daniel. But we know that we, we could see him grow him through the ups and downs. We knew it through us by just being in his presence and experiencing this with him, changed that, it changed us all. And we know that uh, it was a witness to the world and many of you are here because of that. So we're grateful. And um, you know, maybe I'll just read a, a one, one passage here. Uh, that uh, my favorite chapter in the Bible is Romans 8. And um, Talks early in it about suffering. Uh, for I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And then a little later on in the chapter, it talks about how all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. And then even stronger statement. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, our distress, or persecution, or famine, our nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities nor powers, nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the promise that believers have, but it's only for believers. And I would just uh, I would say that and for anybody who does not believe, um, you're missing out. There's a, one more passage I'll mention. Um, in Luke 13, some people come to Christ, and uh, they talk about two news stories. A bunch of Galileans were massacred in the temple by Pilate's troops. And a, a tower in Siloam fell and crushed, killed 18 people. And the question was, you know, what sin did these people do to deserve this? And uh, Christ's response is that, is, is your sin, are, are you less sinful because you haven't experienced these sins? The answer is obviously no. 
But then he goes on to say, the real story here is about repentance. Repent, for um, suffering does come to all of us. But suffering that leads to repentance, suffering that, that leads to everlasting life, that's, that's what Christ wants for us. So I, I pray that for you. I pray that, for, for that uh, you experience that. Well, thank you. I'm so glad to see you all today. It's like one big family reunion. I can't, I mean, so many years. And uh, just, I know, I speak for the whole family. We're just grateful that you're here. Those of you who knew Dan knew that he was a committed Christian. Even those who were not close friends knew that Dan was a committed Christian. But people who spent any time with Dan after his bike accident, at times they, they saw a different side to him. And they would wonder what the Lord's plan is for his life. As was mentioned by my brothers, Dan loved the Lord, but he struggled. He struggled with mental illness. 
and he would struggle with uh, a very deep depression. The mental illness was the result of his brain injury that stemmed from his accident here on uh, Maryland 27. And when he was mentally in a mentally ill state of mind, he was not living or reasoning in reality. Um, I remember when I first saw it, uh, he was in the basement, he was accumulating all kinds of things, uh, kinds of things, you know, cologne, soap, toothbrush, and he's just got boxes of stuff, and I'm like, wow, what's this all for? And he said, I gotta tell you a secret. You know, God's gonna be coming in a chariot to pick me up. And he thought he could take all this stuff with him. And I just, uh, <laughs> was totally blown away by that. One big trait that was a sure sign that he was having another bout of mental, mental illness was his change in language. He could swear like a sailor. <laughs> I would take Dan to the hospital when he was in this state of mind, and uh, usually he went willingly. Sometimes I had to take him to the hospital by force, Sometimes while at the, at the hospital, he addressed everyone with F you. <laughs> and it really didn't matter who it was. I remember we, I had him in the hospital and he's standing up. He could walk at that time. Not real well, but he could walk. And he's got this big smile on his face. And there's this guy about 10 feet tall in front of him. And he says, who the F are you? <laughs> And I had to quickly get involved and, uh, and say, uh, you know, he's, he's mentally ill right now. And uh, the guy let it go, especially with that big smile. So. And he would say this thing over and over again, you're just an illusion. <laughs> I remember one time, I have to admit this, I didn't put this in my notes. You know, I punched him. <laughs> I did. I said, is that a little, an illusion? <laughs> Obviously, I didn't know anything about mental illness. <laughs> the good news is, is, is that the drug lithium, which is a salt, a kind of salt, helped to curb that problem when it would appear. And whenever it reappeared, there would be medical personnel in place, and they would tweak it a little bit and he'd come right back down to reality. You can understand people who knew Dan before the accident and then see, seeing him like this, wondering what God's plan was for him, especially when they saw such a personality change. Before the accident, he really did have everything going for him. You guys knew that, know that. But after the bike accident, it was hard for him to reconcile his Christian confession with its foul mouth. And when in that state of mind, as was mentioned by Jim, he would, well, maybe he didn't say this, he would throw his money away. If any of you found a paper bag with a couple thousand dollars in it in the trash, it stands. <laughs> And then he would throw his Bible away. When I was at the nursing home, whenever he would get into this mental state of, mental state of mind, and mental illness state of mind, I would say, you know, look at the trash cans, make sure he's not throwing away his money, because he would accumulate it. And uh, his medicine needs to be tweaked. And it was, in no time, he was back to himself. But as was said already, and this is the beautiful thing about Dan, when he was of sound mind, he would think about the way that he behaved and he was repentant. And he asked for another Bible. Dan read the Bible regularly. And to be honest, truthful with you, he read it and, and nothing else. He read it at the nursing home 
He didn't watch TV. He didn't read other books. He just read the scriptures. Then there would be the deep depression. And he experienced it, he experienced it a number of times. And when this deep depression came on him, Dan would try to take his life. When after the bike accident he came out of his coma, he thought he would have a full recovery. That was mentioned. He really did. He was excited about it. He was motivated about it. But after a year, it became obvious that that would not be the case. And when the depression came on as a result of the thought that uh, he wasn't going to gain anything back, he twice, as I recall it, ran his car into a tree. A number of different times he would swallow poison and it would be spontaneous. He would see something that looked like poison and he would just guzzle. Several times he overdosed on his meds. Once he tried to walk in front of a moving train, he actually walked into it and then fell back on his butt. But his worst attempt at trying to kill himself was when he jumped from a five-story window to the cement below. Dan wanted to break his neck in that fall. But God had him shatter his pelvis, which caused some internal damage. But thanks to medical personnel, he, he did recover. In every attempt to leave this world, by the grace of God, people were there to pick up the pieces. And God used these experiences for Dan, for Dan's good, and for the good of his people. And the manner of speaking, I thought of this, he was like Jonah, running away from the Lord because he didn't like the Lord's way of doing things. The rest of the story is that the Lord in his mercy to Dan stripped him of everything else he would hold on to in this world. He did. Kind of like Jonah being swallowed by the fish. And this is true for everyone who is in Christ. Not that we are all going to have it as rough as Dan did or as Jonah did, but their life was a picture of what every Christian needs to let go and to follow Christ. Christians need to lose their life for Christ. And by the grace of God, we do. It's a daily struggle to to re react and to do the right thing when all those sinful impulses uh, bear, bear down on us. I thought of Galatians 2, verse 20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Dan went to a nursing home after recovering from the jump from that window. And Dan had, he had many good and encouraging days at the nursing home where, where he resided, right across the street from the high, uh, Westminster High School. But there were, were occasions when mental illness would raise its ugly head and when depression would set in. On some of these occasions at the nursing home, he tried, he tried to starve himself to death. The nursing home would call me when he wouldn't eat. And they asked me to come and talk to him. And when I got there and I asked him why he was starving himself, he would say, because it's the one thing that I can, can control. And I would go in and tell him that he was behaving selfishly. <laughs> I'd take that away. 
that whenever he behaved, behaved this way, he was hurting himself. I would say this to him. Hurting those who love him. And most importantly, he was sinning against God. And I told him that whenever he sinned against God, he made his circumstances far worse. Because there were consequences for his actions. Dan, for example, lost a lot of mobility after that jump from the window. And he had no one to blame but himself. He had a colostomy for a, a, colostomy for a time. He lost the muscles on his stomach because of that jump. And it set in motion the intestinal blockages that he would receive. He had four of them. And I, remind, and I reminded him that he did not fear God when he behaved this way. Friends, it is hard to talk to him like this because I knew I was guilty of the same sin that I was accusing him of. I too want to be in control of my life. I want things my way. And like Dan, I need to be told over and over again to get over myself and by grace submit my life to God's control. And what is true for Dan and I is true for all of us. Dan's life was a picture of our true need. When he struggled against God, God chastened him all the more until by grace Dan would once again begin to struggle against his own sin. And when he struggled against his own sin, he more and more was characterized by repentance. He would cry out to God to have mercy on him, a sinner. And my life too by grace is a cry that God would have mercy on me, a sinner. For all of us who are Christians, the trials of life point us, point us to Christ. I thought of this parable. I thought it was appropriate. It's from Luke 18. It's verses 9 through 14. It says... This is Jesus speaking, speaking. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Brethren, there are just two kinds of people in this world. Those who thank God that they are not like other men, and those who beat and cry and say to God, be, be merciful to me, a sinner. When you measure, measure yourself by God's law and think you are better, better than murderers, adulterers, fornicators, homosexuals, hypocrites, slanderers, thieves, scammers, you demonstrate that you do not understand the law of God at all. For the Bible teaches us in Galatians 2.21, it says, 
I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Righteousness does not come by your good works. And let me put it another way. If God were to say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? Most people respond with, well, I'm not a murderer, nor a prostitute. I think overall I've lived a pretty good life. But if that is our response, your righteousness is no better than the righteousness of the Pharisee in the, par in the parable I just read, who thanked God that he was not like other men. And Jesus taught that unless your righteousness surpasses the righteousness of such people, of the Pharisee, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. For this Pharisee, he trusted in his own goodness. And consequently, he thought he was better than others because he obeyed God's law better than the many that he measured him up, himself up to. What he didn't know was that the intent of the law was to show men that they were law breakers. For the Bible teaches there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. That's Romans 3, 10 through 12. A Pharisee says, well, I never murdered anybody like that murderer over there. But Jesus says that if we, if we have a hateful anger towards our brother, that we are actually guilty of murder. The, the Pharisee says, well, I never committed adultery. Jesus says that if you look at a woman with lust, you have committed adultery. According to the scriptures, the only way people change for the better is when they are made to see that they are the problem. That is when you need Jesus. Jesus was without sin because he was God. And being a man, he would identify with our weaknesses. In death, he charged his righteousness to all whose sins were actually charged to him. And he died the death we deserved that we would live our lives to him that we would trust him and not ourselves. The tax collector cried out for mercy. He knew he was a sinner. He had no hope in himself to secure his own salvation. Dan too was brought to see his need for Christ. Dan was bought, brought by the grace and mercy of God to repentance again and again and again. Truth is when I would rebuke him for his selfishness, I was exposing the log in my own eye at the same time. And his being rebuked was my, was my being rebuked. And now here's something sweet to consider. We talked briefly on it. Every time Dan was rebuked of his self-righteousness, every, every single time, when he was, was of sound mind, but he was in a state of depression, he broke down and cried. He would tell me, you're right. He would convey to me that he sinned against God and he would pray that God would forgive him of his sins. Like the man in the parable, he cried, God give mercy to me, a sinner. He would pray after such conclusions to our time together and after prayer, you know, I told you that uh, he would sometimes try to star starve himself to death. That's when they would call me to talk with them. Well, after prayer and after this talk, Dan would be happy and grateful to God. And he would eat and he would drink. 
and he rejoiced in the Lord his Savior. As I said earlier, there are only two kinds of people in the world. Those who thank God that they are not like other men. And those who are stripped of everything. Whose hope is in Christ alone. If I were to simplify everything I just said, it could be summed up in two words. Trust God. Lean not on your own understanding. And I'd like to end right now with a response I received online. Some of you read it. It was a response to his passing. A young lady, she wrote, my, my father, Mickey, and I would go to, the, to watch the wrestling matches at North Carroll High School. How I admired Dan. I was about seven years old and thought he was perfect. While he was warming up before one of his matches, I asked Danny if he would win his next match for me. His answer was, I wrestle all my matches for the Lord. And then he knelt in prayer. And he went out and won. <laughs> I bumped into Dan many years later after his accident. I was a nurse at a clinic. I struggled with wondering what the Lord's plans were for Dan's life. I've learned through other life experiences that the Lord doesn't like to answer why questions he always comes back to the same answer, trust me. I don't deserve to grieve like close friends and family are today for Dan. I was only a spectator on the sidelines during his high and then in his low in life. I didn't see him again, so I'm hoping he found peace. If not on this earth, it's guaranteed for him now. My prayers and condolences to you and your family and to all who love Dan. And that's, that's the conclusion of the letter. In closing, I can't answer all the why questions. I can only speak to what God has revealed to us. God ordained Dan's accident. And God was glorified in his life. God's people also benefit from Dan's life. Everyone who knew, who knew him or, or hears of him. And here's the story. Dan fought the good fight. He finished the race. He kept the faith. He trusted in the Lord. And he has found peace. Amen. Through this with Dan, for you to be here, for you to share, and, and we're really honoring God here by... Um, by remembering Dan and uh, how he did fight the good fight. So, um, I graduated high school uh, with Dan. I apologize. Yep. <laughs> we weren't really close friends. He played all the wrong sports. <laughs> <laughs>
My dad was our high school principal, so we go visit them together. And Dan Yule was like the modern day Job to me. Mm -hmm. And when many people would have said, why do you keep honoring God? Why? You know, because of all you've been through. His faith was rock solid. Mm -hmm. And yes, he had his ups and his downs um, and his struggles, but every time I saw him, he either had his Bible with him or he was just preaching to me. He was just <laughs> sharing about how wonderful God is. Um, and uh, he's just an amazing guy. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I remember being a young guy, and young Dave, and Dave and I being what young guys do, and typically causing trouble. <laughs> and avoiding the parents. At the Paul's I remember avoiding Dan because he was so serious, so starry. Like if you were running into a room, it was an end step forward. Sorry. And slide over. Um, but later in life, you know, as you grow and you mature and have your own family and do your own stuff, I never forgot that because to have everything taken away, but to still find a purpose. Man. I mean, that was a heck of a lesson at that age. Mm -hmm. um, so, thank you. Thanks, Tom. Mm -hmm. So, I won't talk now, but. So, yeah. So, yeah, that's why. Oh, yeah. Yeah, just yeah, back towards me. Just watch, watch your footing coming up through here and then straight ahead. We're going to follow the gentleman here up to the grave. Take your time. surprise us um, and, and, and pending doom and struggle. Uh, it's a theme of the scriptures. Uh, Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord as they are about to go and struggle against their enemies. Um, David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear evil. Job said, yea, though you flay me, yet will I trust in you. This culminates, right, with Jesus saying, if anybody wants to be my disciple, he has to pick up his cross, right, and follow me. One of the most comforting things I think Jesus said uh, the night uh, before he was taken and began to be beaten, he said to his disciples, he said, listen, these things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. That's ironic for what was about to happen because he said, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I think, um, Bob, you know, it was like a, a, a living sermon for Dan, his struggle and, and ups and downs, and we all learn from it. We're pruned by it. And we would say things to Dan, you know, and, and, uh, and Sometimes maybe in a self-righteous way, other times just because we cared about them. Things, you know, about trying to, to, you know, gird up his courage and his joy and to be grateful. 
and it was oftentimes hollow because we weren't struggling the way Dan was struggling. And I found that one of my uh, this uh, a letter from C.S. Lewis to a friend who was also struggling, and it would be the kinds of things that we would say to Dan, but now Dan can say to us. <laughs> and uh, and if he could be here right now, this would be his words to us. And I'll conclude with this. Pain is terrible, but surely you need not have fear as well. Can you not see death as the friend and deliverer? It means stripping off that body which is tormenting you, like taking off a shirt or getting out of a dungeon. What is there to be afraid of? You have long attempted a Christian life. Your sins are confessed and absolved. Has this world been so kind to you that you should leave it with regret? <laughs> and then this final piece. There are better things ahead than any we leave behind. Mm -hmm. There are better things ahead than any we leave behind. Friends and family, every grief we have to believe with faith. Every grief, every heartache, every sorrow, every loss, every failure that we experience, every journey that we see like Dan's life, it's teaching us, it's reminding us, it's imploring us, it's begging us. This life is not your own. Your death is not the end. The world is not your home. And everything that lies ahead, believer, is better than anything we leave behind. Let's pray. Amen. King of heaven, my treasure thou art. I, King of heaven, my victory. Oh!